All right, welcome everybody. We're uh, delighted to be here this morning and to uh, to welcome Dr. Marilyn McPherson uh, to, to join with us again. She was here with us last year. Uh, those of us who've been around the field appreciate um, um, the value that she has been to our profession and uh, one of the preeminent uh, palliative pharmacologists uh, that we've that we've had. And so uh, it's just a real treat to have her share with us this morning and impart her wisdom. And um, so uh, she'll be happy to, uh, to take your questions and, and you can uh, um, put those in the chat uh, or you can um, uh, unmute and ask if there's a gap along the way. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Lynn. And uh, thanks again for being with us. Of course. Good morning. Happy New Year. The only thing 2024 has brought me so far is a cold. So please forgive my voice. So Dr. Mulder asked me to kind of do a little potpourri of medication related stuff. So this presentation is titled Medication Tips, New Drug Update and Deprescribing. So that should keep us out of trouble. So these are the learning objectives, which is pretty much just what the title just reflected. I'd like to start actually with deprescribing. Um, I'm actually working on a book with a couple of colleagues and kind of, instead of calling it deprescribing, we're calling it goal concordant prescribing. I think that sounds less punitive, and it's certainly more in line with what we're talking about. Okay, so first off, what the heck is polypharmacy, and why should we care about it? I actually had a pharmacy student who said polypharmacy means a patient who goes to more than one pharmacy. So I, I don't know. That might be true, too. What do you think? Is it taking two or more beds concurrently, five or more, nine or more, or my students' idea of two or more pharmacies? What do you think? Anybody want to render a guess? Pardon? Well, the answer would be theoretically in the literature, most people would say it's B, five or more medications. Now, we know that polypharmacy is highly prevalent, but it's growing. If you look at this, about 8.2% of people were taking more than five medications from 1999 to 2000. Uh, a little more than a decade later, it's up to 15%. And, you know, we've certainly gone on since then, might even be more now. If you look at long-term care, pretty much everybody was getting more than five or more meds, with three-fourths getting nine or more, 65%, uh, almost 10 or more. So that's just crazy. What are the consequences? I mean, this is unsurprising. Frailty, dementia, cognitive decline, disability, hospitalization, and increases in mortality. And, you know, when we think about the medications we use in serious illness, it's all of those things, plus... I mean, there's been studies looking at what is the anticholinergic burden or the sedation burden of patients who are receiving hospice or palliative care. And, you know, the average age in our population is probably in the 70s. And then we have to look at the disease associated and age associated pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic changes as well. So how, what, what do you think about this? How does the number of medications patients take as they near the end of life compare with patients at a similar age bracket? What do you think? The same, more or less? Come on, Trinity, I can see your little faces. I can call on somebody. What do you think? What's your vote in that room, Trinity? <laughs> You're all not answering. You're all looking. Let's go, cool, guys. I'd say less. Less. I'd say less. Less. Quite all. I think you would hope it's less. So let's look at this. This is um, really interesting data. Uh, this one study looked at medication regimens oh, over three years before death and 500,000 older adults who died in Sweden between 07 and 13. The percentage of people taking 10 or more meds increased from 30% to almost 50%. That's just crazy. Then a retrospective study of over 500 nursing home patients in Sydney, Australia, looked at the same thing. The overall medication use changed little. The symptom management drugs went up a little bit. The disease prevention went down a little. But at the th time of death, a third had actively prescribed antithrombotic agents, antihypertensives, and osteoporosis medications. You can't go to heaven unless you have good bones. And this one kills me. 179 <laughs> patients in the last week of life in a hospital, hospice, or home in Netherlands. The mean number of meds used per patient was nine on day seven before death. And this last bullet just throws me over the edge. 30% of patients received a preventative medication on the day they died. I mean, I think maybe that's a little extreme, don't you? 
So if polypharmacy is the problem, what is the solution? Well, it's been called several things through the years. It's been called the geriatrician salute, de-intensification, and mostly now we call it de-prescribing, although I still like gold concordant prescribing. So de-prescribing is defined as the process of withdrawal of an inappropriate medication supervised by a healthcare professional with the goal of managing polypharmacy and improving outcomes. So again, I think this is gold concordant care. So what are the patient's goals of care and how do the medications address that? This next slide and this slide and the next slide I look at perceptions. This is looking at uh, patients' perceptions. Survey of community dwelling older adults living in Canada. And the, the data seem to be fairly consistent. About 80 to 90 percent say, you know, I'm okay with it, but I would really be okay stopping some medicines too if my provider thought this was possible. Survey in Australia, 40 percent said they would like to stop taking one or more. And this went up to 80 percent if they said their doctor was on board with that. And similar results. And look at the last one that's data from the USA uh, for Medicare uh, beneficiaries. 92 percent were on board if my doctor said it was okay. At two thirds that I really would like to reduce the number of drugs that I'm taking. So what do prescribers think about this? This is interesting also. A survey of physicians in Parma, 75% said, I feel pretty good about my ability to de-prescribe, including preventative meds. Uh, but a little more than half were comfortable stopping guideline recommended medications. But 40% were reluctant to stop a medication prescribed by another physician, particularly if it was a specialist. And we see that in hospice all the time where I mean, you know, specialists, uh, the cardiologist wants to go to the very last minute, and sometimes it's uh, difficult to uh, make those decisions. And these are pretty similar uh, uh, thoughts throughout this slide. All right, so this is, this is the money slide, I think. How do you go about looking at a medication regimen and making a decision? The first is this a kind of a three-tiered approach. The first is like a model or a framework, and really, it's just kind of a mind shift, like approach your decisions about prescribing with a different mindset. So considering the things we just talked about, the goals of care for the patient, I think some other things, and I will bet most of you don't even know this data. It's hard to find sometimes. What is the time to benefit for a medication? So, you know, if you start morphine, it's probably going to start working in an hour or so. That's great. How about a statin? How long does it take a statin for the lines to separate treated versus not treated, showing a statistically significant benefit? The patient's life expectancy. I, I must ask that question every single time I talk to a doctor or a nurse when they call me about a hospice patient. I'll say, well, what, what do you think the patient's prognosis is? And there's a big difference when I'm recommending drug therapy changes, whether the patient's you know, actively transitioning or well, I don't even, not even sure she's even hospice appropriate. Considering the clinical status and whether the treatment aligns with the goals. So this, again, is just that 20,000 foot view way of thinking. The next is using actual tools uh, to assess an entire medication list. Again, considering the patient's status, just with every medication, ask yourself, do we really have to continue this medication or could we stop it? Then come up with a list of meds to consider deprescribing and prioritize them. It's never a great idea to start more than one drug at a time or to stop more than one drug at a time, unless you know you're on pretty firm ground, like I'm okay stopping the multivitamin and one other drug, for example. I don't think that's going to upset the apple cart too much. And then the third level is really detailed guidance on deprescribing an individual medication. So guidance specifically looking at the statins or the proton pump inhibitors, for example. <clears throat> so again, revisiting these three this model or framework is kind of a high level model. It's a way of thinking. And we already talked about all of these points. So approaching the entire medication list. This is the second um, approach. Tools that outline approaches to identify and prioritize drugs for deprescribing. One of my favorites is Stop Frail. You certainly should take a look at that. And you can even print out the one pager or PDF it and put it in your phone and your files. It just goes over like 15 different categories of drugs and has some pertinent information for you about what should I do in someone who's older or frail, has a limited life expectancy. Certainly, everybody has heard of the beers list, but I have to tell you, there are some times where the guidance from the beers list would contradict the guidance we would have for end of life care. So you got to be careful with that. And, and there are others, DFARM, MedStopper, and so forth. So these are tools that include general principles to use when evaluating the whole medication list, looking at the benefits and harms, 
<clears throat> considering whether the medication is likely to help an individual achieve their goals of care and considering the burden of treatment. <clears throat> They can have a stepwise approach or an algorithmic approach. So here is the stop trail. So I will send Dr. Mulby these slides. And if you want to, you can either pull the um, original study or you can PDF this one slide. It's just sort of like going through each, you know, body system of drugs and asking yourself, do they really need this? Like, I still see people on theophylline. I still see people with COPD on Montelukast for allergies. Do we really need that? Uh, and then musculoskeletal, is, did I miss a federal law that everybody's got to be on three or more calcium and vitamin D supplements? It's all over the place. So I think this is very beneficial. Um, another website that I really like, this is called deprescribing.org. And they've got these lovely little pocket cards on several groups of medications. They've got the PPIs, and you know we overuse the PPIs. I mean, this you can see how it happens. So if a patient is really ill in the hospital, maybe they're even in the ICU, somebody puts them on a parenteral PPI to prevent a stress ulcer. So, okay, that's great. And then a well-intentioned resident moves them out to the floor and says, oh, they can do oral now. So then switch them to an oral PPI. And then another well-intentioned resident sends them home, discharges them, and they come home to us to hospice still on an oral PPI when they didn't, they don't even really need it at this point. It's fine if it's over the counter Prilosec, which is 50 cents a day. But when you look at things like Nexium, the purple pill, it's $6 a day. And you know, not that they're terribly risky drugs, but no drug is a free ride. The antihyperglycemics, I have a whole talk called Give the Dying Diabetic a Donut. I think that's so important. Just the other day, a hospice nurse asked me to write up a one pager explaining to patients and families what do we do with diabetes and serious illness? So, I mean, I'm happy to share if you want to take a look at that. But you can see this card right here in front of you is the antihyperglycemics. So they've got the front, the little decision flow sheet. It's very helpful. I really like what they've done with the cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine. Uh, and then there's a backside to it. So Alzheimer's disease is a perfect example to talk about deprescribing. Obviously, Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of 50 million affected worldwide. You all know what it is, a relentlessly progressive neurodegenerative disease with the average age over 75, worsening memory, declines in language, and so forth, behavioral and psychological symptoms, and the survival depends, four to eight years. And the goals of care are to slow the functional and cognitive decline and maximize symptom control and quality of life. So what are the treatment options? Well, non-pharmacologic, so we should all be doing Sudoku every day. Somebody said that to me last year, and I was like, you know, I'm taking a course in quantitative statistics. I think I'm okay on the Sudoku angle. Manage comorbid conditions. And then we don't have a ton of drugs. So actually, I can add a new one to this list now. We've got the cholinesterase inhibitors. We have the NMDA receptor antagonist, memantine. And then they put them together in Namzeric and aducanumab. And now there's another one, which we're going to talk about at the end. <clears throat> so let's look at a case. <clears throat> Miss Judy. It's so a 78-year-old woman. She has had repeated falls in the last three months. She's got a past medical history of breast cancer, hypertension, dyslipidemia, NVAF, but no stroke, Alzheimer's disease. She's a fast 7C, which means that she really is hospice eligible with a greater than 10% weight loss and a recent UTI. So I live in Maryland. So that's where I made the, the, all the action happening. She lives with her daughter, Laura, in Maryland, but her son, Frederick, is a lawyer who lives in California. So obviously you know what's coming here. It's always the doctor or the nurse or the, the pharmacist or the lawyer child who lives on the other coast who likes to tell us what to do. Here's Judy's medication list. She's on Dinepazil, Memantine, Lysinopril, Atorvastatin, Warfarin, a multivitamin, iron, and calcium and vitamin D. What are your thoughts on this medication regimen? Why don't you unmute and tell me what you think? Pardon? She probably doesn't need a majority of those, not all of them. I agree. I agree. You could probably stop them all. But when you suggest slimming down on the meds, Laura is on board. But Frederick, on the other hand, the lawyer from California, he goes ballistic and angrily says, what's wrong with you people? Are you trying to kill her off? Yes, Frederick, you're too smart for us, you caught us. So are there any issues here? Of course there are. So I am a huge fan of using an evidence-based approach to not only make your decisions, but to have these conversations with patients 
their family members, and informal caregivers. So if we look first at the cognitive enhancers, denepazil, galantamine, and rivastigmine, they're indicated for mild to moderate, moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, and memantine is just only for moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. They're not very expensive, they're generic, it's, the cost is not really the issue. <clears throat> so you know that you have to be a fast 7A at least to be eligible for hospice, so she is a 7C. So let, this is the study that everybody points to and says, oh my gosh, these drugs are still very, very good for advanced Alzheimer's disease. So let's take a look at this study by Howard, published in the New England Journal of Medicine a, a decade ago. He looked at 295 community-dwelling, moderate to severe Alzheimer's patients <clears throat> who were already being treated with denepazil for at least three months. Their mini mental state exam score was anywhere between 5 and 13, and they followed them for a year. They were stratified by the study center, <clears throat> how long they'd been getting denepazil, either the minimum three to six months or six months or greater, their baseline mini mental, 5 to 9 versus 10 to 13, and their age. So as you can see on the cartoon here, <clears throat> the four groups were denepazil plus placebo, memantine plus placebo, both active drugs or both placebo. So it's one drug or the other, both or neither. Now, I really like how they did the clinical outcomes, uh, the primary outcomes. So the first was the score on the mini mental uh, showed a cl clinically important difference. So they looked at the mini mental state exam as one indicator. So, and they decided that if you compare one group to a different group, if there's a score of 1.4 points or greater higher than the comparator, that would be considered clinically significant. And then I also like that they did the Bristol Activities of Daily Living Scale, which is a scale that the caregiver completes. Because how many times have we heard the caregiver say, look, I know it's not going to you know, help her memory or anything, but it's easier for me to care for her when she's taking this medication. Okay, great. This is a 0 to 60 scale, and the lower the number, the better the patient is doing. So they decided that a score of 3.5 points or greater, lower than the comparator, would be clinically significant. So remember the baseline mini mentals are around 9.1, 9.2. The baseline BADLS was about 27 to 29. So just a reminder of what is clinically significant in the researcher's opinion. So they looked at all the groups that got denepazil with or without memantine versus those who did not get to nepazil, the change in the mini metal score was 1.9. So that did achieve clinical significance in their mind. But the BADLS did not because it had to be 3.5 points or, or, or more lower than the comparator. And looking at all memantine versus no memantine, neither the mini metal score or the BADLS achieved clinical significance. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that the only thing that made a difference is the denepazil. And you can see it's just barely over the line. And the effect of denepazil and memantine did not differ significantly in the presence or absence of either. So when they did a sub-analysis of people who were getting only denepazil versus denepazil plus memantine and vice versa, there was no difference. So this is, this is the money slide here. When they did their sub-analysis and they looked at People with the mini mental coming into the study of 10 to 13, the impact of denepazil on their mini mental was 2.6. So that's way above the cut point of 1.4. But then when they looked at people with a mini mental of 5 to 9, it fell short of the clinical significance marker of 1.4. So the bottom line here is memantine, we already voted off the island, and denepazil only really seems to make a difference, at least in their study. Uh, with people who had a mini mental of 10 or higher. I love this slide. I love this slide so much. I want to blow it up and wallpaper my bathroom with it. This slide was done by Reisberg, who's the guy who came up with the FAST criteria. And what you see here is <clears throat> in the second row, the GDS and FAST scale, one to seven, and then he even breaks it down for the seven. Then the second to last row is the mini mental state score. So he is hypothesizing that once somebody is a FAST seven, their mini mental score is around a zero. Now, I'm not sure you can say that uniformly about everybody. I mean, I, my favorite professor in pharmacy school had a sign in his lab that said, even a blind squirrel finds some nuts. So maybe somebody has a little bit higher mini mental score than zero if they're a fast seven. But you know what they're not? Is they're probably not above 10. So <clears throat> I think this is pretty good evidence that you've got to pick your patients carefully. And then, as I said earlier, no drug is a free ride. So if you look at the adverse effects, memantine is pretty well tolerated, actually, but you can see dizziness, headache, 
confusion and constipation. Now, the cholinesterase inhibitors, on the other hand, nausea can be fairly impressive, particularly that 23 milligrams of nepazil, really nauseating, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, insomnia, fatigue, and muscle cramps. The thing that worries me is the cholinesterase inhibitors have, are vigotonic. Uh, vigotonic effects on the sinoatrial node and AV node manifesting as bradycardia or heart block. As a matter of fact, if you look at hospital visits for syncope, bradycardia, pacemaker insertion, and hip fracture, you can see the odds ratio ranges from 1.18 all the way up to almost 2, 1.76. So this is a clinically significant phenomenon. So they're not completely a free ride. So in my humble opinion, I think when someone has advanced illness with Alzheimer's disease, like hospice appropriate, the dementia meds are less helpful and more harmful in advanced disease. I do not think they should be, I don't think they are indicated, nor do I think they should be provided to the patient if they're a FASC, unless you have clear and ongoing benefit demonstrated uh, that it may be in managing those identifiable and distressing behaviors. I will say that if you go to that deprescribing.org website and go to the dementia part, all that work was done by the University of Sydney. They've done some amazing work and they've got some beautiful tables like if you decide to stop these medications and behavior recurs, they've got a nice chart saying, when did that behavior recur relative to stopping those medications? So if it was within a few days or a week, well, then maybe you should have decreased or stop the drug. If it's six weeks later, it's probably the disease. It's not, it's not stopping the drugs. I think it gets a little stickier for us in hospice when the patient is admitted to hospice, maybe with, I don't know, lung cancer, but they also have Alzheimer's disease, but they're not a FAS7. So if they're less than a seven, I think we have to have a conversation about the goals of care, for example. And I tell hospice nurses, look, any drug that messes with your head or your heart, I would taper off. I would not just stop suddenly. So a couple of reasons. I think, you know, it's a CNS active drug. So I would taper to see if any symptoms, you know, get worse. Often we will see patients get better and they have better behavior when we stop these drugs. But if they do start to have behavior, say you reduce the dose by 50%, you could easily go back up to the dose um, that's not a problem. Also, it lets the family see. Um, it's kind of a good faith thing for the family because generally speaking, it's not going to make things worse and they can see that before you just stop it cold. But back at the ranch, is Frederick buying what you're selling? No, he's not. So I think it's important that we, I think communication is a big, big part of this. <clears throat> this is the spikes protocol, uh, which is really a nursing protocol for breaking bad news. As setting up the interview, you want to do it someplace private and confidential. Perception, how much does the patient or the caregiver know? <clears throat> Invitation, find out what do you want to know? Uh, knowledge, can I give you some knowledge and present it to you? Um, and, you know, when you say, you know this better than I do, when you break bad news, and you guys do this all the time, when you say something like, I don't think these medications are bringing anything to the table. As a matter of fact, I'm concerned that it may be increasing the risk for side effects. And then you just zip it and be quiet. You know they're gonna have an emotional response because you've pretty much just said, you know, I think your mom is so far down the road that these drugs are not helping. They clearly are not slowing the disease. Matter of fact, that's often when somebody objects and just says, oh my God, what are you talking about? I'll say, um, you know, I'm a big fan of motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is trying to get people to change behavior, but we can use it here too. It's sort of like Columbo. Remember any, any of you old enough to remember Columbo or watched it on Nick, or Night, Nick at Night or something? You know, Columbo was a detective and he, when he was talking to the suspect, he was kind of like playing him along a little bit. And then right before he got in the car, he turned around and said, wait, one more question. And that's when he had him. So motivational interviewing is when the person whose behavior you're trying to change can come to the conclusion on their own, they're more likely to change the behavior. So for example, in this conversation, I would say, well, riddle me this. A year ago, how was your mom? How was she different than now? Oh, a year ago, she could walk up the stairs by herself and she knew who I was. Okay, so she's been on this medication ever since then. Do you think she's declined since then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. She, she needs assistance to ambulate. She doesn't know anybody in the family anymore. So then you can point out the obvious. So despite being on this medication <clears throat> that we hope would slow the disease progression, her disease has continued to advance. And if they can see that, often it's very helpful. And then your strategy and summary. So when you look at the guideline consensus with uh, the drugs for Alzheimer's disease, just kind of pulling it all together. Remember, this is the that level two, looking at all these different tools. The beers list says, well, the cholinesterase inhibitors 
do cause bradycardia. So be very careful in older adults with syncope due to bradycardia. The stop frail criteria <clears throat> says no consensus really on the cholinesterase inhibitors, but memantine, they say stop it for moderate to severe, which is indeed the indication. So that's kind of a kick in the pants. European consensus guidelines say if the prognosis is less than three months, these drugs are inadequate and only special circumstances would warrant consideration. The Australian guidelines, uh, well, these are the people, University of Sydney, who wrote the deprescribing.org. They say recommend a trial of discontinuation if they've been receiving for at least a year and have had worsening of disease or no benefit noted or they're end stage. And if the behavior recurs, you can certainly resume therapy. And the rest is kind of the same, but it's nice to see everybody's on the same page here. But you need to know this data so that when you talk to other prescribers and you talk to the patient and their family, you can have an evidence-based conversation. Uh, so again, here's everything about the University of Sydney. I love what they did. Uh, please take a look. They have both evidence-based recommendation and consensus-based recommendation and some very practical practice points for all seven of those groups of drugs. I think it's very nice. And here's their de-prescribing card, which you probably can't see from my, from my slide, but I've given you the, the web link there as well. So in conclusion about de-prescribing, this line is the prescribing continuum. So first you're gonna evaluate your patient. And you know what, I have a whole talk with the drug therapy selection process. When you go to think about how can I treat this patient for this problem, you, you identify the problem, you assess the problem, um, then you come up with your therapeutic goal, and then you come up with your monitoring parameters for the therapeutic goal. And then you say to yourself, okay, what are the non-drug things I can do? And then what's my short list of medications I could pick from? So that short list is kind of swirling around in your head, but then you have to consider things about that patient and things about the medications on your short list. So for example, if the patient has a history of ulceration from non-steroidals, you're probably not gonna pick a non-steroidal to treat the patient. Um, you try all the medication, you may need to titrate the dose and you're gonna monitor to see how they respond. So for example, if I had high blood pressure and you started HCTZ and I came back a month later, two months later, and you said, you know what, it's surprising. Even though we've increased the dose, it's not working at all. I think we should switch to an ACE inhibitor. Okay, I mean, am I gonna cry about that? No, of course not. Because that's part of the prescribing continuum. But the stakes are so different with an advanced illness, particularly with these medications that hopefully are prolonging the patient's life. Uh, so I think it's important when you start a drug, you have to be very clear with the patient and family um, that this is, we're gonna try it. We're gonna try it. This is not a forever and ever kind of deal. So very important. Any questions about deprescribing or the dementia drugs in particular? Okay, let's move on to some medication tips and tricks. We're gonna do it's kind of speedy here. It's, uh, a roadrunner, kind of speedy. This is kind of a mix of things that I just, I pull on these all the time. I'm sure you've heard of pseudobulbar affect and often we will have prescribers say, I'd like to try new Dexta in this hospice patient. So new Dexta is a combination drug indicated for inappropriate laughing and crying for the pseudobulbar affect. And it's composed of dextromethorphan 20 milligrams and quinidine 10 milligrams per capsule. And the SIG is one capsule a day for a week and then you go to one capsule, capsule twice a day. But here's the problem, it's $1,000 a month. I think I'm gonna get pseudobulbar affect since I'm in charge of the formulary. So any thoughts on this? What would you do here? Just... Well, first off, why are these two drugs part of this combination? Dextromethorphan is an uncompetitive N-methyl deaspartate receptor antagonist and a sigma-1 receptor agonist, which we think modulates glutamate signaling. So dextromethorphan is metabolized to dextorphan and fencyclidine-like behavior effects exhibits anticonvulsant and neuroprotective properties, which is awesome. But then we have quinidine. What's with the quinidine? Quinidine is along for the ride as um, purposely causing a drug interaction. Quinidine is a 2D6 inhibitor, which means it's going to increase the dextromethorphan bioavailability 20-fold and prolongs the elimination halfway from two hours to 13 hours, which is why you can give it twice a day. So here's, here's the deal for you. I know I can't do it in one capsule, but you can have it compounded. You can get the quinidine compounded as a 30 milligram per five ml solution. So it's about not, not even a dollar a day. And then you can get dextromethorphan over the counter. The formulation Delsum, which uh, is a twice a day oral solution. It's a cation exchange resin. 
So for, you know, about 30, 40, 50 dollars a month, we could try the drug instead of spending a thousand dollars. Cause I don't think it's a slam dunk that every patient responds, but that's a nice little tip to keep in your back pocket. <clears throat> this is, <laughs> you ask anybody who's had a hemorrhoid and they will say, oh my God, it's the worst thing ever. So for someone with rectal pain or anal pain, whether it's a, a thrombosed hemorrhoid or an anal fissure, this is a compound that you can get a pharmacist to make. Now this suppository mold is known as the rectal rocket. And for obvious reasons, it looks like a rocket ship, right? So it's probably, I guess, about an inch and a half long. And it's compounded with hydrocortisone 1% and lidocaine 2%. And they they pour it into this mold and then it, it looks like this rocket ship when they take it out of the mold. So you can see the pointy end goes in first, that flange right there, the middle, where it like dips in a little bit, that is the, the demarcation between internal and external. So the bottom flange, the bottom of the rocket ship stays external to the patient. But what does it do? It's holding it right there at the site of an application. It doesn't go all the way internal. So that's where the hemorrhoid is, where the anal fissure. So it takes uh, hours and hours, like six, seven, eight hours for the body to melt through that indented part. And then the, the flange just falls off in the underwear or whatever. But data has shown three of these bad boys, one Q12 times three, the hemorrhoid's gone. It's amazing. It's really amazing. But you do have to have a pharmacist who can compound and who has a special mold. All right. So who can tell me what is with the slit down the side? What's that for? Any ideas? Yes. What'd you say? Yes. Isn't it yes. for gas? Right. To let gas escape. Very good. Good. All righty. So, you know, I've been talking about stopping medications, but a, a point about that the International um, Society for Medication Practices uh, reports on drug withdrawal symptoms. At least 10 reported cases of withdrawal is constitutes a report saying this is a drug you should not stop suddenly. Twice as many as expected given the total number of adverse effects and 95% probability the withdrawal is not due to chance alone. So what do you do about stopping medications or not stopping? Uh, this is a slide that I share with the nurses because hospice nurses, you know, they, they run the show out in the field. So these are the drugs you really should not stop suddenly. So certainly it's anything, as I said, that messes with your head or your heart, but specifically anything that affects serotonin. So all the antidepressants, drugs that affect GABA, so pregabalin, gabapentin, all of those. The opioids, certainly you don't want to stop those suddenly. Drugs that affect dopamine, <clears throat> so all the antipsychotic drugs, and drugs with other mechanisms like baclofen, cetirizine, zaconitide, antihistamines, they say PPIs, but, you know, we probably do stop those suddenly and muscle relaxants. So, um, you know, I think it's a good idea to go to 50 percent, wait a couple, three, four days, depending on the half-life, and then stop the medication. I think this is uh, I want to share this article with you. This is an article about what do you do about anticoagulants at the end of life? I love this slide. You know, it's decision time. What are you going to do? You think about all the data that, about the patient, the evidence, what's the scoop? What is the risk? What is the reward? So it's benefit and burden, really. What would be the impact on this patient? Um, I love on the bottom right, they say, do you feel lucky? Very Clint, Eskwood, Clint uh, Edward, um, Clint Eastwood, there you go. Uh, what's your perspective? And then what do you do? So I urge you to find this article. This article is amazing. I just did a presentation for our nursing staff and our providers um, kind of simplifying this even a bit more. Use of antithrombotics at the end of life, an in-depth chart review. It's open access. You don't even need permission to use this diagram. So it starts off with a patient has a life-limiting condition, meaning less than three months. So if someone is less than three months, um, you should certainly put this into play. First off, have they had active or recent troubling bleeding? If the answer is yes, then either stop the anticoagulant or for goodness sake, don't start it. And the same thing is if death is imminent within a few days. <clears throat> then if the death is not imminent and they're not bleeding, then you decide, okay, is it an antiplatelet we're talking about or an anticoagulant or maybe both? And antiplatelets decision-making goes over here. They talk about primary prevention or low-risk secondary prevention versus high-risk prevention. Again, either for the primary prevention or low-risk, stop it or don't start it. And for high risk, maybe continue it. And they tell you what is a high risk patient. It's been less than three months since they had a stroke or a TIA and so forth. Less than six months that they had a bare metal stent placed. Here's all the abbreviations over here. Back at the ranch with the anticoagulants, then they ask you to evaluate the thromboembolic risk. Is it high as shown by all of these medical conditions or is it low, which is these conditions here? 
And then if it's high, you're still not done. Then you have to look at what's the risk of the patient bleeding. Is it low? Like using the has bled. Um, so one of my residents did a project looking at the Chad Vesk and the has bled in patients in hospice and palliative care. And it came out to be even, even Steven. So the risk of having a stroke using the Chad Vesk was the same as the risk of having a bleed using the has bled. So I urge you to find that article, maybe even do a journal club about it. I think it's very useful. <clears throat> okay, another little tip here. I love this, olanzapine. This is a study done down south looking at 30 patients, 16 women, 14 men, age 39 to 79 with an average age of 63. They were having nausea unrelated to chemo with advanced cancer. The chronic nausea had been present for at least a week and the severity using a numeric rating scale was three or more on a zero to 10 scale. So they put half the people on olanzapine five milligrams at bedtime or placebo daily for seven days. And the patient reported outcomes uh, baseline and daily for seven days was the change in that numeric rating for the nausea. The baseline median nausea score was nine out of 10. Wow. The placebo after one week and one day was still nine out of 10. That's not surprising. Olanzapine after day one, one dose, and went from a nine to a two. And after a week, it was a one. So, you know, I've always been a big fan of Haldol, but um, this is once a day. It's generic. It's dirt cheap. It's like $10 a month. Uh, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So the patients also had less emesis, less rescue antiemetic use, better appetite, less sedation fatigue, and better well-being overall. So I think this is a great trick to have. Now, of course, nausea, I think, is as or more complicated than pain in people with an advanced illness. So you have to figure out what's causing it. But this is speaking more to like garden variety induced nausea or uh, due to the cancer due to the drugs that we're using. Well, I hate to bust your bubble here, but this is about mirtazapine, Remeron, looking about its effectiveness in treating anorexia because we always say, oh, this will increase your appetite. They looked at 120 patients with anorexia. Their appetite loss was a four or greater on a zero to 10 scale. And they had cachexia defined as greater than a 5% body weight loss over six months or 2% plus BMI greater than 20. <clears throat> and a depression score was less than three on a zero to six scale. They were randomized one-to-one -to, -one <clears throat> to either metazapine 15 at bedtime or placebo <clears throat> for eight weeks. And the primary endpoint was change in appetite from baseline to day 28. But secondary outcomes were quality of life, fatigue, depressive symptoms, body weight, lean body mass, hand grip strength, inflammatory markers, adverse events, and survival. So here's the good news. It was associated with significantly less increase in depressive symptoms, but there was also a higher prevalence of somnolence, which is great because we often use Remeron for sedation, but there was no difference in other outcomes, including appetite score. So mirtazapine does not increase appetite. I'm thinking if you really, I mean, I think the biggest thing with a declining appetite is this, mostly the family that's upset. I mean, I know when my father was very ill, my mother would work for like six hours cooking an amazing dinner, and then he wasn't interested and she was just destroyed. Um, so it, it, a lot of times it's the education is important. Okay, so um, if you have known me for more than five minutes, you know I'm very interested in uh, opiate conversion calculations. I don't know what kind of an equi-analgesic chart you have at your facility, but this is the one that we've used for years and years and years. 10 milligrams of parenteral morphine is 30 of oral, 1.5 milligrams of parenteral dilaudid is 30 milligrams of oral morphine. Well, my, my good friend, Akila Reddy, did a lovely study. She's a doctor at MD Anderson looking at people who were on IV hydromorphone and then she looked at switching when they were switched to either oral hydromorphone, oral morphine, or oxycodone, what was the ratio? So the ratio was not what we had in that original chart. So this is the results from her study. She showed that if anybody was getting, for every one milligram of IV dilaudid, if they were on less than 30 milligrams a day, the oral hydromorphone would be 2.5. So over here, we showed that it was five to one, but it's really not. It's closer to two to one. Uh, if they were greater than 30, it was about 2.1. If they were switching to morphine, it was 11.54. So it was not 20 to one. So you can imagine if you've been operating on a 20 to one all this time, and really it's closer to 12, you've either been underdosing or overdosing your patient. Um, so that's why, um, I, I wrote a book on opiate conversion calculations and I changed the chart in the last edition to reflect Dr. Reddy's data. So uh, I, when you look at 10 milligrams of prenomorphine, I know the old chart said 30. And yes, if you hold a gun to my head and I'm driving around the beltway and 
eating a donut and doing my nails and somebody calls me for a conversion, for ease of calculation, I may divide or multiply by three in my head and then adjust from there. But I can show you data, absolutely fabulous data, showing it's 10 to 20, it's 10 to 25, and then it's 10 to 30. So this is the art part of opiate conversion calculations. I mean, my pharmacy students look at a chart like this and say, yippee skippy, there's one right answer. But that's not true. That's not true. Uh, but importantly, uh, two milligrams here of IV dilated, work, by lowering this to 25, and again, I've got data to substantiate it, it's a 12 and a half ratio. So it's very much in keeping with what she had found. The other thing I wanted to mention is my favorite opioid in the universe, which is my girl, methadone. Uh, this is an infographic. When I did my PhD, it was in um, the, the efficacy of infographics in educating informal caregivers about the medication we use at end of life. And the infographic way outperformed the little text uh, flyer that we had. Anyway, this is a front and backer, everything you need to know about methadone. So how does it work? Well, we know it's got three different mechanisms, binds to the mu receptor, it's an N-methyl diaspartate receptor antagonist, although more recent data is showing probably more at the higher doses, and we probably underestimated its contribution by inhibiting serotonin reuptake in the central nervous system. Got a long half-life, so on average, 24 hours, so it's going to take four to five days to get to steady state. I think it's important to talk about who's a good candidate, who's not a good candidate. So anybody who truly, truly is allergic to morphine or any other phenanthrene, methadone or fentanyl is a good choice. Also significant renal impairment, methadone and fentanyl, you're going to be the best choices there too. Neuropathic pain or pain of mixed pathology, because I think we have seen this time and again, that using methadone over another pure mu opiate agonist, you do get a little bit of an extra kick against the neuropathic pain. Don't forget, neuropathic pain is not 100 responsive to opioids, no matter which one you pick. If the patient's pain is still refractory to other opioids, or this is a very practical reason, you want a long-acting opioid, but you need an oral solution. In fact, you need a high-concentrate solution. So methadone is a great choice there. So to be fair balance, so that I'm not totally team methadone, who's inappropriate? If somebody will be gone before they get to steady state, um, it's not that I wouldn't switch. I mean, you certainly can, um, but I would be more likely to say, let's leave them on their pain regimen, and we'll just add a little methadone on top. And then it seems sometimes like within a day or two, that does show you a bit of a therapeutic effect. This is a big one. Someone who lives alone, poor cognitive function, functioning, they don't have a good caregiver. Maybe they have a history of drug abuse or they're just plain unreliable. Methadone has no sense of humor. So you don't want people being a freelance pharmacist with my girl methadone. Unstable or severe liver failure. There are a million drug interactions with um, methadone. Absolutely. So you do need to check that out and increase risk of arrhythmia. So I, I included this because nurses call me all day long and you know I, I need them to bring to the table this information so that I can help them make a decision. So I'm a big, big fan of a multidimensional symptom analysis, which is these eight elements, what brings on the pain or makes it worse, what relieves the pain from a non-drug perspective, what have you tried, how well did it work, did you have any side effects, what words would you use to describe this pain, can you show me where the pain is, does it move anywhere, rating the severity, is it persistent? Does it come and go? And then you, how does the pain affect you? What is the impact on your ADLs? So that's all the assessment and presentation stuff. So this is from a paper. Uh, I was the first author. It was a consensus building process, a white paper on the use of methadone in hospice and palliative care. So this is not a clinical randomized controlled trial data. This is data based on all the stuff that's out there to say, this will keep you out of jail, most likely. Um, so take that for what it's worth. We, and we based a lot of this off the American Pain Society guidance on using methadone. Of course, they're no longer in business. But for somebody who's opioid naive, which is anywhere from zero to 60 OME, we say anywhere between two and 7.5 milligrams of methadone a day in two to three divided doses. So we do actually have little old people in nursing homes where we will literally start them on a milligram Q12. If, you know, co-analgesics aren't cutting it, if the non-opioids aren't cutting it, it's a beautiful thing. We use the oral solution. Then if they're on a higher dose, what we do is if they're under 65 years old and under 200 milligrams a day, we do a 10 to one conversion. If they're on greater than 200 milligrams a day and or over 65, we do a 20 to one conversion. So instead of hurting your head and making you do the math, am I your new best friend or what? If the patient was on morphine or hydrocodone, then you look at what dose they're on per day, like 60 to less than 90, 90 to less than 120. Here's where your methadone range should be, whether they're under 65 or over 65. Now, of course, you can 
you know, adjust this as needed. I would never do nine. I would go up to 10, for example. And I did it for oxycodone and hydromorphone. So those are your big players. This is probably 90% of your business. I think this is very helpful. When you look at drug interactions, there are a lot of drugs that induce methadone metabolism, and there are a lot of drugs that inhibit the metabolism. But when a nurse or doctor calls me, I say, I think of the three A's. Is the patient on amiodarone, any anti-infectives, including antibiotics, antifungals, and antivirals, or are they on any antidepressants? These are your big enzyme inhibitors. So if they are on one of those drugs, whatever I calculate, I just reduce it a little bit, about 25%. If they're on an enzyme inducer, I don't change anything from what I calculated. I just am very, um, I really encourage the use of breakthrough. And whoops, rules of the road, don't increase the methadone before five to seven days, or at least five days. Uh, this is really more for home-based hospice. In the hospital, you know, when you've had three full days, 72 hours of methadone under your belt, you're 87% of the way to steady state. So you probably could do a little sooner if the patient's in a well-monitored environment. But this is important. Don't increase the methadone by more than five milligrams total per day until they're up to 30 a day, and then don't increase by more than 10 a day. So often we'll have a patient on methadone 10Q8, and the hospice doc says, well, it's not really working. Let's go to 20Q8. No, 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 no. You cannot do that. Um, again, methadone is very unforgiving. And then no matter how much opioid the patient is on, like we get people referred to us on like crazy things like dilated 20 milligrams IV an hour. What the heck? So even though the calculates out to an enormous amount, we don't start at greater than 30, maybe 40 milligrams of oral methadone a day. End of discussion. Um, I just thought this was crazy. This is Vibrant. It's indicated for the treatment of chronic idiopathic constipation. Uh, it, the patient swallows this bad boy and it vibrates. And this vibration is what stimulates laxation. Isn't that crazy? Um, and then I want to talk about intensiles briefly. Mr. Jones is a 58-year-old man with lung cancer admitted to the inpatient hospice unit for pain out of control. His pain was eventually controlled in an IVPC infusion of morphine to an hour with a one milligram bolus Q15 PRN. He's very weak and having a hard time swallowing, but he wants to go home. Do we have to send him home on the IV morphine? So he's on the equivalent of about 162 milligrams of oral morphine a day, which if we, how old is this guy? He's 58. We could switch him to methadone. And so that's going to be a 10 to one. So it's 16 milligrams. <clears throat> so we could also use a high concentrate oral morphine solution for a breakthrough, and you calculate the breakthrough as 10 to 15% of the total daily dose. So it's going to be somewhere between 16 and 24 milligrams based on his total daily dose of morphine use. So the order would be using the methadone, 10 milligram per mil solution, we're going to give him 8 milligrams Q12. So that's going to be 0.8 mLs. And the morphine is going to, we're going to give him 20 Q2. That's going to be 1 mL. So you can prop somebody's upper body up 30 degrees and put up to one ml in the buccal cavity, and it works great. And we've got a lot of different intensiles, as you can see here. How much actually gets transmucosally absorbed? Well, if you're looking at morphine or oxycodone, not much, 20% or less. That's because morphine and oxy are very water-soluble. So the more fat-soluble a drug is, the more you've got a chance it'll be absorbed from the oral cavity. Now, if you look at fentanyl and buprenorphine, we're up to 50, 60%, but it doesn't matter. Because if you propped up their body and you put that morphine or methadone solution in the buccal cavity, it's really just going to eventually slowly trickle down the throat as if they had swallowed it. So it doesn't matter that it's not transmucosally absorbed. It's just kind of hanging there as like a depot effect. And then I just wanted to share this tip because I love this tip. I just recommended it yesterday. For somebody with chronic kidney disease who has intractable itching, uh, this is a lovely study looking at 12 patients. Uh, again, you have to dose adjust pregabalin and gabapentin for renal impairment, but they gave people just 25 milligrams a day of pregabalin. Their itching went from the pain associated with itching from 9.7 down to three. So really very, very effective. All right. Any questions on that before I get to the last portion of our presentation? Everybody looks like they're still awake, so that's a good sign. Okay. I just want to give you a little preview of the new drug talk I'll be doing at the annual assembly this year. The, some of the most influential drug and vaccine approvals from this past year. Well, I can speak personally about Paxlovid. I've had COVID twice and I had Paxlovid both times. And I swear to you, I felt better like by it the next day. It was fairly magical. I know that people worry about the relapse. Uh, I was just at the, um, I was in a meeting, the family practice physicians in Chicago and going through the exhibits. 
and the Paxlovid guy um, was standing there. And he said, what do you think of that aftertaste? And I said, well, I think it's dreadful. It's a combination of dirty gym socks and I don't know, something despicable. And I said, but you know what my opinion is? It tastes better than being dead. So suck it up. But it does leave a terrible off, uh, aftertaste. So we've had it for a good while. You know, after it was used for 11 million courses, the FDA granted full approval. It was available all along under emergency compassionate use. All righty. So the RSV vaccines, we've got a Rexy, a Brizvo, and a Bayfortis for a respiratory syncytial virus. So I, I, it's for infants and older adults where, you know, it's, every time you turn on the TV, you hear about, they say January is going to be a real corker between influenza, RSV, and COVID, you know, batting the hatches because we're really in for quite a ride. And then, of course, I get a cold and I was like, oh, my God, it's COVID again. Um, so we have three vaccines now. The RexV, which you see on TV all the time, is for adults over 60, uh, one dose for the season. And it's been, it's been thought that the vaccine will protect you for two seasons. So it's early days yet, but if you go by that, it may be an every other year kind of vaccine. Uh, a Brizvo is for adults over 60 and certain pregnant women. And then we have the one that is for children. So uh, my daughter has three children. The youngest right now is six months old. So when he was four months old, uh, the Rex B vaccine came out. So my sister is a community pharmacist and we were happening in her store one day and she said, you know, you should get the RSV vaccine because the baby's only four months old and you would hate to give him RSV. So I said, okay. So we got the injection and she said, well, I'll just go ahead and bill your insurance. You can go ahead and go. So we weren't out of the parking lot before she called me and said, I have really bad news. You owe me $700. Your insurance did not cover it. So you may want to ask the patient to make sure their insurance will cover it. Uh, and the other thing is it hurt like blazes. This is the most painful injection I've ever gotten in my whole life. It's probably tied with Shingrix. And it's because it's um, there's something called like an adjuvant as part of this vaccine that makes it really painful. I mean, I know I'm a big baby, but this was a corker. And my arm really, I wanted to like rip off my right arm and beat my left arm to death for like the next week. And the kick in the pants is a couple of days later, the baby got RSV. So there you go. All right, Opal. What the heck is Opal? This is interesting because it's, it's Norgestrel. It's the first OTC birth control pill in the United States. So the FDA approved it in the summer. It's set to launch earlier this year. And it's thought that it will reduce all the barriers to obtaining oral contraceptives. It's going to be somewhere between $10 and $50 a month. Zorzuve. What the heck is Zorzuve? Uh, this is a fast-acting antidepressant approved in August of this year. This is the second drug we have for postpartum depression or a significant period of depression shortly after giving birth. The first on the market, Zalreso, is an IV infusion over 60, 60 hours in a supervised healthcare setting, and women just don't want to go to the hospital for 60 hours. So this new one, Azorazuve, is oral. So um, it's 50 milligrams per day for 14 days. Anybody want to guess what that two-week course of therapy is going to run you? $16,000. That's enough to depress you right there. Okay, lecanemab. This is the drug I said I could add to that Alzheimer's slide. Um, so this is the first clinically backed Alzheimer's disease medication that targets the root of the condition. So it works against the plaque formation. So it really is getting to the root. So you, that the um, lecanemab I talked about, which came out like a year or so ago, that's been labeled as the worst drug launch in the history of drug therapy. It's just just awful how it didn't really even have the data, the clinical trial. I'm not even sure why the FDA approved it. And when the FDA did approve it, half of their advisory board resigned from their appointment on the committee because they were so dyspeptic about it. Anyway, this is pretty impressive. Compared to placebo, this lowered the worsening of dementia symptom severity by an average of 27% over a year and a half. Um, so again, the Adjuhalm, Adjucanumab, it still has not shown clinical benefit. They are doing... Uh, um, post-marketing surveillance uh, class four, stage four. Um, anyway, it slows the progression of Alzheimer's disease by neutralizing and eliminating the toxic amyloid beta aggregates found in the brain. OTC naloxone, this is pretty exciting. They approved it in March of 23, and they think this is going to be a big hit because it will reduce the stigma that you don't have to go to the pharmacy, get a prescription and so forth. So it'll be you know, in the same aisle as the ibuprofen and the cough medication. It's anticipated this will be about $44. And unless you've been on Mars all this time, certainly you've heard about the GLP agonist uh, approved for diabetes for years and now used for weight loss. So trizepatide, which was Mongero for diabetes, is now Zepbound for weight loss. You know, it's a once a week injection. 
and patients lose an average of 34 to 48 pounds after 17 months. And th this one does work better than semaglutide because it's a dual GLP-1 agonist and a GIP agonist. So what, is, what does this do in the body? It decreases energy intake and increases energy expenditure. It enhances the first and second phase release of insulin secretion, decreases glucagon, it enhances insulin sensitivity, it decreases food intake. I, they say separate from the effect of causing nausea uh, and it slows GI emptying. But when people stop taking the drug, two thirds regain the weight. This is a corker, Valoctoco gene, Roxaparvo. Well, that's a kicker. This is interesting. This is the first gene therapy for adults living with severe hemophilia A, of course, a genetic bleeding disorder. A one-time dose reduces the number of bleeds by over 50% and reduces the need for other medications. So this is gene therapy. And it's uh, anybody want to guess what that one-time infusion is going to cost? $2.9 million. And that's not as bad as uh, this. This one almost made me cry. This is two medications, but the first one is the one that everybody's excited about. It's for um, sickle cell disease. It turns, so you know sickle cells caused by a gene mutation. This finds that gene, snips it out, and inserts the correct gene. It is a one-time IV dose, and it's $2.2 million. So can you imagine being a person who has lived with sickle cell disease, and you're one of those unfortunate people who had a severe form of the disease, and then you had a child and you realize you had passed on the gene. And the only treatment to make it go away, literally after one infusion, is $2.2 million. So I, my husband and I were driving last night, I put these slides together yesterday. I said, you know, if we sold everything we owned, the house, my jewelry, the silver in my teeth, liquidated our retirement, could we raise $2.2 million? And I think it was nip and tuck there, but I mean, we've worked for a hundred years, so maybe we could pull it off, but, but that's just crazy. There was another drug for um, spinal atrophy approved a couple of years ago, also $2.25 million. And that drug company would allow the insurance company to make installment payments of 500,000 a year for five years. That's insane. And they calculated this price not because it costs so much to make the drug. They looked at how much is a life year worth or the suffering from sickle cell disease. And if somebody lives to be 80 years old, that's about $2.2 million. This just makes me insane. It makes me insane. Anyway, that's the, my story. I'm sticking to it. Do you have any questions or anything for me at all? Let me stop sharing. I will send Dr. Mulder my slides and I'll send that methadone infographic in case you would find it useful. Thank you so much for the lecture. That was outstanding. Um, I had a pharmacist that I worked with uh, recently that was had done some international work and talked about compounding domperidone. I was wondering if that's something that you have seen in light of this um, uh, deprescribing and trying to avoid the sedating medications. Yeah, we don't have that here, and I don't even see it being compounded here. It's on the market in Canada. Uh, so, I, no, I don't really have any more info on that. But, you know, I think if you talk to, there are pharmacies that specialize in compounding. They're members of the Pharmacy Compounding Centers of America, and they, this Pharmacy Compounding Centers of America orders in from international sources all the powder you need to make these specialty formulations. And they've got special, as you saw, the rectal rocket mold and things like that. So if you can find a compounding pharmacy in your area, they, I can tell you, they do a lot of work for zoos internationally. Uh, but they can also do things for you. But I can tell you, I mean, my pet peeve about compounding is show me the data because sometimes you hear about these wackadoodle combinations that really don't do anything and they're very expensive compounded products. But certainly you can check it out. Anyone else? Well, then this is Joel Phillips, um, neurologist by trade, as well as palliative care. And I appreciate what you're saying about the, the dimepazil and the cholinesterase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. I, I think the trend here, at least in West Michigan, is we, we tend to get away from using those cholinesterase inhibitors in dementia quite quickly. Um, most patients early on maybe do it for a little, a little while, but by the time they're seeing me from the palliative perspective, they're already off them. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that that's Kind of the, the data supporting what we're doing already upstream before they're even getting to hospital. So 
Yeah. Well, I think West uh, Michigan must be ahead of the curve because in hospice, we get these people all the time. And, you know, hospice has to provide all the medications related to the terminal diagnosis and any comorbid condition that can influence the terminal diagnosis, which in the CMS's opinion is pretty much everything but their multivitamin. But anyway, so, you know, it's still a drug cost, but more importantly, it's the tablet burden. It's the side effects of the medications. So I guess my plea for all of you is please follow that model of deprescribing in dementia and apply it to everything we talked about here. So hospice would be so grateful if upstream palliative care helped us do some heavy lifting. So don't send somebody home on Oxycontin. Please switch them to generic long-acting morphine or methadone. I know you're in a tough spot with methadone because unless you can keep them till they get to steady state, you can discharge them, but you've got to throw the ball to somebody who knows what the heck they're doing with methadone. I understand that's a challenge, um, but if you can do that, that would be great. So we really would appreciate any help you could give us. Anyone else? Follow-up question to that is how do we get more methadone prescribers in the community? Start educating, absolutely. Hey, I'll give a lot talk for you. I'll give it, to, I'll, I'll even record it for you. You can play it over and over. I think you need to do community outreach. I think if you can get, you know, CME credit for the prescribers and teach them how to do it, but it, but minimally, if it's a person with an advanced illness and they're hospice appropriate, identify the hospices in your area where the prescribers know what they're doing with methadone. And I can't say that's true of all hospices. So I would reach out and say, you know, like, I work with a large hospice that's in 39 states. And, you know, part of my job is I'm on call 24 seven to help with methadone dosing. So I must get three or four calls a day to do that, but um, which is great, but not all hospices have somebody who is crazy in love with methadone like I am, but try to find a couple, three hospices, talk to their medical directors and say, you know, we would like to, you know, know who's got it going on with methadone. But education, please do community outreach to your prescribers. Anyone else? Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I've seen some people use Haldol as like co-analgesic with methadone. Have you seen that or is there data to support that? Because I haven't been really found convincing data. I know. I, first I heard that, I was like, what? You're on crack cocaine. There is a little bit of data that it decreases opioid induced hyperalgesia. If you look at the work from Shelley Salpeter, S-A-L-P-E-T-E-R, she's published two articles now with Eduardo Bruera from MD Anderson, and she calls it her magic pixie dust, where she would start people on methadone, low dose, like two and a half Q12, and then she would start very low dose Haldol, and she saw really a reduction in opioid requirement and an improvement in pain. So I think it's early days yet to really take that to the bank, but there is some data to support that, yes. I'm not sure I would do that routinely, uh, but it's interesting. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? I have a question about if you're needing to titrate or increase the methadone, um, finding, my, being mindful of the fact that, you know, compliance is better, let's say, if you do it twice a day as opposed to three times a day. But I don't know, is there pharmacologically how... It, if I was to increase, let's say you started 2.5 BID, would you go, would you increase five BID or would you go 2.5, let's say three times? Would you go three times as opposed to increasing twice? I guess. Right, question. I see what you're saying. Uh, but for the first part of your question, pharmacologically, uh, the terminal elimination of half life being so long, and that's what predicates, you know, the dosing interval uh, and the accumulation. Uh, most people can get by on Q12. It's certainly not enough to do once a day, that's for sure. If you do have somebody who's a bit of a rapid metabolizer, uh, you may have to go to Q3. And the way I would make that distinction is, are they clearly showing end of dose deterioration? Like after eight hours, they're really hitting the breakthrough medication. That would make that decision for me. Um, but so far as increasing the dose, I mostly go by how much of the breakthrough they're using. I don't think if someone's on two and a half Q12, would it hurt them to go to five Q12? I don't think so. If they're not having any adverse effects, if you are worried, you certainly could go to the two and a half Q8 before you make that next jump. Um, or if you're getting the oral solution, which is my favorite thing in the universe, and you might not do for an ambulatory patient, you could bump it up to three or four milligrams Q12 and keep your Q12 hour structure. Methadone comes as a 10 per one and a 10 per five oral solution. And if you find that compounding pharmacy in Western Michigan, they can make it 40 or 50 milligrams per mil, the same as they can do morphine. Thank you. Sure. Just, I, I'm always worried about, 
um, medication errors because methadone comes 10 to one and morphine comes 20 to one. So you got to make really good sure that you do a good job educating uh, either the patient or the informal caregiver. Well, I show that it's 836 and I don't want to keep you here all day. I'll send in my slides and my email is on that first slide. You're welcome to reach out anytime if I can do anything to help. Well, thank you again very much for joining us today. And I always look forward to these lectures myself, but I'm looking forward to the upcoming meeting at the Academy too. So thanks good. again. I'm looking forward to the warm weather. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>